Coconuts, they are a whole food straight from nature. So then why in the holy heck do so many people say coconut is bad for you? Well, today we are diving headfirst into the coconut chaos here on The Exam Room. We're not talking about politics, but we are talking about two completely separate sides of the aisle. On one side, you have people saying coconuts will kill you if you eat them. The other side of the aisle says the only way a coconut's going to kill you is if one falls on your head. So what is the skinny when it comes to these coconuts? Are they a healthy food? They're chock full of fiber? essential nutrients, or are they still kind of a junk food that is cloaked in nature's natural packaging? I don't know, but clearing up the coconut confusion for us today is Dr. Neil Barnard. He is the author of the new book, the forthcoming book, The Power Foods Diet, available right now for pre-order. And also along those lines, a little bit later in the show, we're going to be doing the Power Foods Focus, where you might be hearing for the first time about the calorie trapping effect of fiber. You heard me right, the calorie trapping effect of fiber. Stay tuned for that with the Power Foods Focus. But right now, if there's a question you have for Dr. Barnard and about coconuts, the doctor's mailbag is wide open. Post your question in the comments or in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can here on the show today. So with that, let's crack open this coconut chaos. Dr. Barnard, welcome back to the show. Great to have you here, my friend. Good to see you, Chuck. Are you like me? I mean, do you find that when it comes to coconuts, I mean, you have people who are really set in their ways when it comes to these things and they get fired up about the coconut. It's either super healthy or it's super unhealthy. Which camp should we be pitching our tent in, so to speak? Well, the, the, the coconut, as, as you said, it's a natural food. But on the other hand, it's way high up in a tree. And it's something that people aren't going to get an enormous number of. And certain parts of it are less healthy than others. Here's what I mean. You cut a hole in the coconut and the water that's inside, not so bad. However, to make coconut milk, you know, you don't, you don't milk the coconut. The way that, that coconut milk is made and ends up on the shelf of your store is you take actually the meaty part of the coconut and it's all smooshed together. And then, and then you basically are extracting a fatty liquid from it. So the coconut milk and then the coconut creams that are made from it are pretty high in fat, especially saturated fat. All right. But are you telling me, though, that even though it's high in saturated fat, is it really as unhealthy as, say, an extra large fry from the local greasy spoon? <laughs> well, you, 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 I can't say you've set a very high bar here. Um, <laughs> Really, <laughs> but no, researchers have studied this question where you bring in individuals and you actually feed them coconut fat uh, or, or products made from it, or you can feed them coconut itself. And what you will see is that their cholesterol levels do go up. There's no question about it. They go up substantially. Um, so the question then is why? Uh, you send the coconut to a laboratory and they will tell you right back in about six hours that the coconut, the, the meaty part of the coconut, is really, really high in saturated fat. That's a very unusual thing, uh, very unusual uh, in the, the plant community. You just don't see plants like that. Um, if you send virtually anything, any vegetable, any other fruit, uh, any bean, any whole grain to a laboratory, they find very little saturated fat. Coconut is a, is a really big exception. How does that compare to something like an avocado or a nut, both of which are also notoriously high in fat for being a natural plant food? That's right. Um, they're both high in fat, but here the coconut is really high in saturated fat. That's the cholesterol raising fat with, uh, say, avocado or an olive. They are high in monounsaturated fat. So calorie wise, they're all a problem. Calorie wise, every fat gram, whether it's saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, whatever, they've all got nine calories per gram. They're all fatty. But the coconut is saturated fat that raises your cholesterol. The avocado is monounsaturated fat. That's not going to raise your cholesterol so much. Now, if you if you want to get into the fine points, if you're studying for the test, uh, actually about 14% of olive oil is saturated fat. Most of the rest is mono. For a coconut, oh my goodness sakes, it's 80 or 90% saturated fat. 
So where does this whole idea that coconuts are healthy, especially coconut oil is a healthy oil, where where does that come in? Is this marketing magic? You said it. It is all marketing. And 10 years ago or so, it was pomegranate and pomegranate juice. And that's got to be the thing for you. But look, look at what the dairy industry does. They'll call milk real milk. Um, you know, it can cause real indigestion all kinds of real problems but it's 100 percent marketing to label it as healthy and the coconut industry is doing exactly the same all right uh donna is wondering we were just comparing it to french fries at the greasy spoon let's open up the doctor's mailbag really quickly uh wondering how the fat in coconut compares to the fat that is found in cheese something you and i have talked about at length here on the show okay great question uh with cheese it's dairy fat of course and with dairy fat, it's not quite as, as highly, it, it is highly saturated, but not as high as saturated as the coconut fat. So, so coconut is almost entirely saturated fat with, with, with dairy, maybe it's 70%, something like that in cheese fat. I guess I'm just so, like, so, so they are both, they are both a big problem. I guess, yeah, I guess I'm almost just having a hard time wrapping my head around this because the coconut seems to be like a major outlier. It's an anomaly. And here you have this food from nature that just is not healthy whatsoever. Like it just blows my mind that you could see numbers like that, that are in line with the burger, the fries, the pizza, the steak, all of those things in terms of even raising your cholesterol. It's just mind blowing to me that we're here. I mean, can you understand why some people might like really have a hard time comprehending the fact that this really is not necessarily a health food? Yes. And it's frustrating. The other side too, is if you go to the health food store, the regular grocery store, and you want to pick up some soy milk. People have gotten afraid that soy milk might cause cancer, which it doesn't. It does the opposite. So they're kind of the, the mythology has worked against it and they've replaced it with coconut milk. You'll find the coconut milk, which people are trying to give a pass to when the fact of the matter is, look at the carton. It's loaded with saturated fat. It's going to raise your cholesterol. So is that like the plant milk? If you're going to avoid one plant milk, coconut milk is the one that you're really going to want to steer away from? Absolutely. Take that coconut fat. You can put it in your hair. You can make your hair shine really nicely. You can shine your shoes with it. You can polish your car with it if you want to. But I wouldn't put it down your esophagus unless you want to have a high cholesterol. Chuck, you said it. You know, it's a natural food. But uh, I mean, there's a lot of things in nature that you don't want to eat. Poison ivy for one, tobacco for another. It's a totally natural thing. But if you wide, wide up that tobacco leaf, stick it in your mouth, you're going to get mouth cancer. So not everything that nature devised was something that you're supposed to eat. So the coconut water, though, that not coconut milk, but the coconut water uh, that is also very much part of the craze. Are there still some really good nutrients in there um, that make it kind of a beneficial option when it terms to in, in terms of just quenching your thirst and looking for something with a little more flavor than water? Um, I would call it benign rather than beneficial. There isn't anything in there that you really need, um, but the water itself doesn't have the saturated fat in it. The, when, if, if you drill a hole in the coconut and have the water come out, it's water with some, some nutrients in it. It has qu quite a lot of potassium in it, but that's not a reason to buy it because there's potassium in just about everything else um, in, the, in the produce aisle as well. Um, but the good, the good news about the coconut water doesn't have the saturated fat. Laurie is wondering, though, even so, when it comes to coconut water, is it a healthier alternative to something like this bottle of Gatorade? Uh, about this, uh, not, not really. <laughs> One is not particularly better than the other. You know, the, the Gatorade came from a factory, that's true, and the, and the, the coconut came from a tree. Um, but the tree is actually a biological factory that made something that's remarkably similar to Gatorade. Um, it's mostly water, has a little bit of sugar in it, a few nutrients. All right. Pat here is uh, doing a little coconut 301 level question here. Uh, so I hope you're ready for this. Can coconuts okay. reduce oxidative stress in the body? They're asking specifically about the antioxidants that might be found in them. Probably not. I, I, I would. That is something that, they, that might be called aspirational, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, by the way, let me come back to your, your Gatorade question, uh, because okay. the, the big thing, the big thing with Gatorade that I didn't mention is Gatorade is also filled with sugar. Um, and that's for a reason, because what's Gatorade for? It would, the, the theory for it was that it's going to help a person who has done a lot of athletic endeavor to rebuild their glycogen so that they can, can com continue to compete or compete you know, later that day. Um, that's the idea that coconut water doesn't have that.
So let me ask you just kind of off topic. I got this one specifically knowing that that question was going to come up on the show today. This is uh, one that they market uh, this Gatorade near it's called Gatorade Fit. And this one um, is sweetened not with sugar, but with stevia, and it does not have any of the red number whatever mm -hmm. kind of dye in there. Um, would you by and large say that this is at least a lesser evil than its bigger brother? Not necessarily. It depends on what you're drinking the beverage for. Um, if you, Once you come over that finish line running your marathon, you at, your body needs sugar because you just burned all the sugar out of your muscles and you burned all the sugar out of your liver. You know, your liver is storing glucose molecules for your muscles to use as fuel. Once that's gone, you need to replace it. And so Gatorade's big idea was we're going to give it back to you. Now, you can do the same thing with a banana. So it doesn't have to be uh, something like that. But that's the whole idea. So if you fill it, flavor it with stevia, then you're not getting that. You're getting hydration, but you're not getting uh, anything nutritious. Yeah, this is interesting. Just by the by, we don't have to dissect this. Just for the uh, purpose of people who might be curious at home. Uh, this one has water, clarified watermelon juice concentrate, natural flavor, which always kind of makes me wonder. They never define what natural flavor right. is. To they this don't day. have to. The government doesn't make them. I'm telling you, to this day, I'm still wondering. Uh, citric acid, sea salts, ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, uh, pure stevia leaf extract, uh, vitamin B3, beta carotene, uh, calcium pantho... Oh boy, I can't pronounce this one. That's a red flag. Uh, pantothenate, vitamin B5. You want to take a stab at that one? Um, okay. So yeah, what these, and a whole bunch what, of stuff, man. What these are, these are mostly additives that are designed to give it the right color, and the right flavor. The citric acid is there to make it tang tangy. Same thing with the vitamin C. That it makes it kind of tangy. That it's basically just flavored water. Gotcha. All right. Well, good to know. All right. So back to coconuts now, as we took that random detour. Um, we've heard a lot about coconuts being good for healthy skin, especially coconut oil. A lot of people will use that instead of lotion. Cindy, though, was wondering, well, let's take the fat and cholesterol and all of that aside. Will eating coconuts actually help improve the quality of my skin? Okay. You can, yes. If you apply it externally, it's fine. I mean, you could do the same with Vaseline if you wanted, but it sounds sexier to use coconut oil. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so there's not really anything to it that, uh, you know, eating a coconut necessarily will be the cure of your dry skin, your eczema, your psoriasis, rosacea, any of those kinds of dermatological issues. No, no. And you don't eat it. I mean, this is, if you want to apply it externally or any product that contains it externally, Fair enough. Uh, Walt, interesting question. Not sure if uh, you know this one or not, but uh, Walt is wondering whether coconuts can cause gas and bloating. Well, what will typically do that is if, if somebody's getting a particularly high fiber food with fiber that's presenting a new challenge for your gut bacteria. So the coconut water, not likely to do that. The coconut pulp can do it because it does have a fair amount of fiber uh, mixed in with uh, the fat. And we talked a little bit about potassium earlier, and uh, we'll open up the doctor's mailbag and take a wider array of questions here in just a little bit. Uh, but Ben is wondering if there are specific minerals that might be found in a coconut that support heart health in particular. That's an interesting question. Yeah, well, the potassium actually is right down that, that line. And, and coconut water is famous for having potassium. And potassium is part of what your, your heart uses for its normal conduction. Potassium is, is an electrolyte that is involved in, in nerve conduction of all kinds, as well as in, in your heartbeat. Um, so in that sense, it's a good thing. However, there is potassium in virtually anything, in anything botanical. So if you pick up virtually any selection of vegetables and fruits, you'll find lots of potassium in that. So, so it's not a reason particularly to go out of your way to buy a coconut. All right, let's broaden the scope of our health discussion today. Take a question from Diane, who sent this one in a little bit earlier. She said, I have read that we should eat produce that is in season only. For example, um, I love blueberries, but when it's off season, I can only find them when they're from Chile or Peru, somewhere like that. Is it better to eat frozen blueberries or just wait until they're fresh and in season and local for you again? Oh, it's a great question. And I don't know that anyone really has the answer to it. Um, on the, the plus side, uh, fresh blueberries are terrific. They're loaded with healthy anthocyanins. They are a great weight loss food and they're healthy in many ways. 
um, those anthocyanins also may have cancer fighting uh, uh, potential as well. So it's, it's a great thing. Uh, the further you got to truck something, the more your environmentalist friends are going to criticize you for all the effort that it took to bring them there. And then there's been a little bit more time for them to degrade. Uh, on the other hand, the health, the health benefits uh, of the imported ones are virtually identical to the ones that were grown right next door to you. Um, you can choose the frozen ones. They're surprisingly cheap. They are ready when you are really, really uh, handy. So that doesn't really answer your question. But what, what we have, from a health standpoint, it's hard to say that there's anything wrong with getting one from uh, that had to be imported from a place where they were able to grow. Uh, interesting one from Valerie. I'm not sure that we've talked about this. We've done bone health and muscle health for sure, but not necessarily tendon health. Valerie's wondering what effect a plant-based diet might have on the health of tendons overall. You know, the, the, the tendons are unfortunately rather troublesome parts of the body because when they are injured, they can take a long time to heal. Um, they don't have um, a good direct blood supply. And so they have to sort of bathe in the nutrients that are around them. And so what that means is that they're really resistant to any kind of dietary change. And a healthy diet is always a good thing, uh, but it's not going to make an enormous difference so far as I have seen in the healing of tendon injuries. Karen B, you guys were talking about coconut milk earlier today. It got me wondering what plant-based milk is nutritionally best for weaning a baby off of breast milk? Ah, uh, okay. Well, the, first of all, I think congratulations are in order. Um, secondly, uh, take your time weaning your baby. I and mean, this is entirely up to you, of course. But let me encourage you not to feel any pressure from an employer from a Nuji family member to say that your baby's too old to breastfeed. Uh, the reason I say that is some, some women feel like, well, I've got to stop breastfeeding right away and get back to work. Take your time. Um, kids can breastfeed for a year, 18 months, two years, they can breastfeed for a really long time. If you are weaning the child er relatively early, the child has to be weaned to a formula, a baby formula not to a milk that's designed for an adult to pour on their cereal because nutritionally they're not equivalent. So uh, there are good uh, baby formulas, typically soy-based, some other ones as well, um, that your pediatrician can, can recommend for you. If you have an older child who is being weaned, there's no need for any milk at all. Um, soy milk is a good one, a very common choice because it's higher in protein than others and it's also a cancer fighter over, over time. Uh, but the only beverage that a weaned child needs, I'm talking about a kid who's two years old and isn't, you know, and, and is not de uh, dependent on, on uh, breast milk, uh, the only beverage they actually need is water. All right, one more, and then we're going to do the Power Foods Focus as we get ready for the release of the Power Foods Diet hitting store shelves March 26th. Final question today comes to us from Victor, who says, you guys have been talking about cinnamon recently on the show, but I'm wondering about another spice turmeric. What are the benefits of taking a turmeric supplement? Turmeric has been studied for a huge long time, and it's, and it's been used in a huge number of, of reasons, both culinary and for textiles and every possible thing. Um, but tur turmeric's claim to fame is as an antioxidant. And so it's used um, partly as a cancer fighter for anything where the immune system is a little bit out of control and where people have aches and pains and autoimmune conditions. That's where people are using turmeric. There are a lot of people who believe in it. There's a, uh, a fair amount of literature uh, behind it. And you can go to the store. You'll see little capsules of turmeric and the typical doses you take them twice a day. But you'll also see turmeric itself without the capsules, without the markup at the health food store. You can try it. You can buy it and see what you think. All right. Coming out March 26th, the Power Foods Diet. And also that night, we will be at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. for the big book release party. That's what I'm going to call it. But one of the things that's in the book, Dr. Barnard, that I'm particularly fascinated by is a concept that you just introduced me to, and that is the calorie trapping effect of fiber. What exactly is that? This is something that I think the researchers at Tufts University deserve a medal. Because what they did is they brought in a lot of volunteers for the study, they had 90 people in the study. And what they actually did, don't try this at home, is they, they fed them diets that were either high in fiber or low in fiber. High fiber, like whole grain bread, brown rice, 
the low fiber is white bread, white rice. And then what they did is they collected their waste products. That's right. Everything that would have gone down the toilet, they collected. And what they discovered um, in a research study that nobody wants to really repeat is that when you eat a lot of high fiber foods, it does something that nobody expected. The fiber goes down your digestive tract. It traps unabsorbed calories, unabsorbed fats, unabsorbed carbohydrate, unabsorbed sugars. And the fiber actually escorts them into the waste. And that's where the researchers measured them. And they discovered that as time went on, these people were not absorbing those calories at all. The people eating the white bread and the white rice and so forth did, did not have that fiber. They didn't have that calorie uh, trapping effect. And they were ending up having about 100 extra calories every day that they could absorb. So uh, high fiber foods include not just whole grain bread, but it includes all the grains, whole, all the grains of every kind, whether it's whole grain pasta, whole grain cereals, all the fruits, the vegetables, and the granddaddy of them all, beans. Beans have a huge amount of fiber with them. A little bit goes a long way. But in addition to everything else they do, they satisfy the appetite, they fill you up, they make you feel great, they have very few calories. But that fiber actually grabs the calories as they go down your digestive tract, carries them away, and you are literally flushing calories away. Get out of town. You can, yep. wow, I had no idea. That is amazing to me. Good to know. You, I you, wonder. Yep. You yeah, know, the, the difference is, the, the difference is about, let's say you went to the 7-Eleven and you got one of those big sodas in there. This is the equivalent of taking half that soda and just dumping it down the toilet. That is a, that's amazing. But let me ask you this though. If you were to say, eat a can of black beans while drinking that soda, uh, is that like a way to kind of offset the damage that the Coca-Cola is doing to you? Or is it better just to stick with the, with the beans altogether? I like look, man. With this junk, look, I man. I mean, people no, love to game the system. No. I'm just being real here with you. I hear you. I, I could see that one coming. I got to tell you, don't mess it up. Okay. Eat healthful foods. And if the health foods are high in fiber, what they're going to do is yes, they would trap other calories that you might eat them with, but they're also going to trap a little bit of the calories, even from your apples and oranges and everything else and carry them away. And that is why when people eat these foods, they lose weight faster. So that's just one of the many effects that you see. And the, the beauty of it here is you take it out of the laboratory and you take the concept that fiber is a calorie trapper. And then you build that into Lindsay Nixon's Southwest uh, chili, something like that. You, you put in the foods that you actually want to have uh, on your dining room table. So that's the reason that I wrote the Power Foods Diet is I wanted people to, to not think so much about all the things you have to not eat, but how about the things that you can eat all the way from soups and salads through to the desserts and they'll get that benefit for you in a lovely way. So true. So true. I mean, eating this way does not mean giving up your favorite foods, never has, never will. And that's a mistake that so many people make, especially at the outset, as they think, oh, I'll never be able to eat this or that again. It's like, yeah, you can. We're just going to show you healthier ways to make it and recreate those flavors that will probably taste even better than the original. So it's fun. It's creative, certainly healthy. And the last thing I will say about this is don't mix beans and soda. I, that's just way too much gas between the beans and the carbonation. Like nobody needs that in their life. So uh, that is March 26th. You can pre-order your copy right now. There's a link to pick up that in the episode notes. And then also exam room VIPs. If you have not yet joined our illustrious club, uh, become one today. It's absolutely free. And exam room VIPs will be among the first to know when tickets go on sale for this big event. You can Sign up at pcrm.org slash exam room VIP and get a whole lot of other perks along the way. Absolutely cannot wait, Dr. Barnard. I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. A whole bunch of exam roomies and physicians committee supporters are going to be there. And you can be there too. PCRM.org slash exam room VIP. I hope that uh, Chef Dustin Harder is going to be bringing something tasty to the evening as well. He sure will. And I have to tell you, Chuck, I have such great memories of, of the party that you threw right at the same place in November. It was a blast. And I'm so glad that you're coming back and you're going to lead off uh, this real power foods revolution that we're going to have. Yes, you'll be there. I'll be there. Dustin will be there. We're going to have a blast. Party's on, man. It's not a party until we're all there and we're talking about the Power Foods Diet. So March 26th, save the date, become an exam room VIP for the ticket information, and then pre-order your copy of the book right now 
All of that is in the show description and in the episode notes. And Dr. Barnard, a huge tip of the cap and a huge thank you to Allison Mahoney and the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for their continued support of the Physicians Committee and powering this episode of the exam room. And the thing that I love about the Ryder Fund is that they do such an exquisite job of carrying on the love that Greg had for animals by promoting plant-based health, which we talk about here on the show, and working to end animal abuse while also emphasizing programs that promote systemic change and benefit every human being here on earth and you can visit the gregory j Ryder memorial fund online at gregoryriderfund.org that's gregory Ryder r-e-i-t-e-r fund.org love those guys dr barnard they are just top notch absolutely allison mahoney and the gregory Ryder fund they're doing such a wonderful job supporting great programs and great organizations we're delighted to work with them Absolutely. And it has been a delight to work with you today, my friend. Thanks as always for raising our health IQs. Right back at you. Thank you, Chuck. And thank you to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen. Appreciate you and you exam roomies. Thanks for tuning in and raising your health IQ right alongside of us. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We will talk to you again very soon, but until then, keep it plant-based.